Hello, and welcome to Game Theory. I'm Professor Naomi Itkoff of the United States Naval Academy, and in this video, we'll define a static game of complete information and introduce the matrix and normal forms of a game. We'll begin by exploring static games of complete information and contrasting them with other types of games. Here's the taxonomy of game theory again. We said we'd study static games of complete information, dynamic games of complete information, and static games of incomplete information. Let's take a closer look at the classification of non-cooperative games. Since a game is a setting in which players strategically interact, we need players and rules for their strategic interaction. The delineations between static and dynamic games and between complete and incomplete information games tell us what kind of rules we can expect to see. In static games, the moves happen simultaneously and independently. Rock, paper, scissors is a static game because the players simultaneously announce their respective moves and choose their moves independently in the sense that neither can condition her move on the other player's move. Sometimes these are called one-shot games. In dynamic games, the players move sequentially. Many play games, chess, poker, tic-tac-toe, etc., are dynamic games. Games of complete information are those in which the game itself is common knowledge. Rock, paper, scissors is a game of complete information, since both players know the possible moves, namely rock, paper, and scissors, and how to determine the winner, namely paper beats rock, rock beats scissors, and scissors beats paper. Poker, on the other hand, is a game of incomplete information, since one does not know all of the other player's cards. Now that we've discussed static games of complete information enough to give at least one example of such a game, rock, paper, scissors, we'll spend the rest of this video exploring the two forms game theorists use to express static games of complete information. We'll begin with the matrix form. Here is the matrix of the so-called prisoner's dilemma, which we played on the first day of class. It's important that a game should have a story of interest that meshes with the game itself. The story behind this game is that the two players are accomplices in some crime. The police apprehend them and give each player the following combination of an offer and a threat. If you're silent and the other guy confesses, we will use all the evidence against you and send you away for five years and cut the other guy a deal and send her away for only one year. However, if you're both silent, the police will have enough evidence to convict you both only on minor charges, and you'll each be sent away for just two years. If you both confess, they will cut you a deal, but since you both confess, they have enough evidence to send you both away for four years. A game, we said, needs players and rules. Game theorists divide the rules into two components, a set of strategies for each player, and a payoff function for each player mapping the selected strategies of all players to a payoff. Win, lose, or draw in rock, paper, scissors. Number of years in jail in prisoner's dilemma. Let us identify all of these components. Players, strategies, and payoff functions. The players, one and two, are labeled in blue here. In a matrix game, we locate one of the players to the left of the matrix proper and the other above the matrix proper. Player 1 strategies are labeled in blue here. Each entry of the leftmost column of the matrix represents a strategy belonging to the player named at the left of the matrix. Player 1 is also called the row player, since her choice of strategy selects a row of the matrix. Player 2 strategies are labeled in blue here. Each entry of the topmost column of the matrix represents a strategy belonging to the player named above the matrix. Player 2 is also called the column player, since her choice of strategy selects a column of the matrix. The remaining entries in the matrix record the player's respective payoffs. The convention is that the number on the left, in red here, is the row player's payoff, and the number on the right, in blue, is the column player's payoff. To find the payoffs corresponding to a particular strategy pair, select the entry in the row player 1 selected and the column player 2 selected. For example, if both players choose silent, player 1 receives minus 2 in red and player 2 receives minus 2 in blue. 
Now, let's see everything in action. Suppose player one plays silent and player two plays confess. Player one's payoff, minus five, is the number on the left in the matrix entry corresponding to the row in which player one plays silent and the column in which player two plays confess. Player two's payoff, minus one, is the number on the right in the matrix entry corresponding to the row in which player one plays silent and the column in which player two plays confess. It's possible, although not as tidy, to use matrices for a three-player game. In this example, players one and two want to go on a preferably unchaperoned social outing. Player three does not want them to go out at all, but if they do somehow manage to go out, player three wants to chaperone them. Perhaps we are in a Jane Austen novel. The three players simultaneously and independently choose dinner or movie. Player one is the row player, and player two is the column player, as in Prisoner's Dilemma. Player three is the matrix player, who chooses either dinner, in which case the players play the game shown in the left matrix, or else chooses movie, in which case the players play the game shown in the right matrix. There are no strong conventions about the order in which payoffs appear in the matrix with three players. In this example, for any given strategy triple, player one's payoff in red is always denoted by the leftmost number, player two's payoff in blue is always denoted by the middle number, and player three's payoff in black is always denoted by the rightmost number. Now, let's play the game. Suppose player one plays dinner, player two plays dinner, and player three plays movie. Player one receives two, and player two receives two, because they are on a date and unchaperoned. Player three receives minus one, because player three is at the movie and knows, since player three sees neither player one nor two at the movie, that they must be at dinner together and unsupervised at that. More important than player three's horror at the impropriety of it all, we can see from this example the main drawback of matrices, namely that they become clumsy quickly as the game gets larger. The normal form is much more flexible and works for all static games of complete information regardless of size. The normal form of a static game of complete information is simply a list of all the components of the game, the players, each player's strategy space, and each player's payoff function. Let's use letter i to represent a player so that i can take any value in the set of players. Big S sub i denotes player i's strategy space, and we use little s sub i to denote a particular strategy in player I's strategy space. We notate players and their strategy spaces as sets. Suppose we select a single strategy from each strategy space, notated in item three by little s1, little s2, dot, 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 little s sub big N. We call these strategies all taken together a strategy profile. Little u sub i denotes i's payoff function. A payoff function maps strategy profiles to payoffs. Here's the normal form of a version of Cournot duopoly. It's not immediately obvious this text specifies players, strategies, and payoffs, so let's parse through this description and identify each component of the game. The players are firms one and two. They are the only entities making any kind of decision here, so we can be confident that they are the only players. Each firm's strategy space is the set of possible quantities. Although the normal form did not state it explicitly, quantities have to be non-negative. There is no negative stuff. Firms maximize profit. So whenever firms play a game, each firm's payoff function and its profit function are one and the same. In this game, the market price depends on Q1 and Q2 as specified in the market demand function. Note that in the case of firms, the normal form does not explicitly state that firms are profit maximizing or what the profit functions are in this game. It's up to you to figure that part out. Now let's see everything in action. Suppose firm one plays Q1 equals 100 and firm two plays Q2 equals 10. Then firm one's profit is pi one of 100 comma 10, which equals 1000. 
Firm 2's profit is pi 2 of 100 comma 10, which equals 100. For comparison to the matrix, here is the normal form of prisoner's dilemma. The payoff functions are explicitly stated here. Since a prisoner's payoff function is not implicit, the way that profit is the implicit payoff function of a firm. The normal form of prisoner's dilemma is clumsy compared to the matrix form. On the other hand, the normal form of Cournot duopoly takes just a few lines, while we could not have written it as a matrix due to the infinite strategy spaces. Each form has advantages and disadvantages. Which form to choose mainly boils down to the number of players or the size of the strategy spaces. For two-player games with two strategies per player, matrices are the clear choice. They are compact and elegant, and especially with practice, you can read and study a two-by-two -two matrix game very quickly. As we saw with our three-player example, matrices become unwieldy once we expand beyond two players. Writing down Cournot duopoly with its infinite strategy spaces as a matrix is nigh impossible. The normal form is much more flexible than the matrix form, and by its very nature works for any static game of complete information. However, the normal form does take a bit more practice than matrices. We'll use matrices when feasible, but many of the games of interest will be large enough that the normal form is the only sensible choice. Modern research papers in game theory sometimes give small matrix-based examples, but the exposition of the paper always presents the normal form. Thanks so much for watching this video, Defining Static Games of Complete Information and Their Matrix and Normal Forms. In the next video, we'll begin our discussion of what play we can expect to see in a game, including a definition of Nash equilibrium.